we are ready to review for unit test two. Now this is at the end of block B, which of course runs from weeks five to eight, and it's technically due at the end of week eight. Although you do have that extra week until Sunday, the end of week nine, to get test two completed. Now, like other tests, this one will be one test in two parts. The first part will be comprehension, multiple choice, true, false, matching, and that part will use the Respondus Lockdown browser. So no additional notes, no additional input for that test. There will also be an applied portion of the test, which you will complete before you begin the test. You will use Excel and JASP and a data set that I provide for you. You will answer all of the items, run the analyses, put those answers on your answer sheet, and then you begin the test and you will fill in the blanks on your test from the answers on your answer sheet. And this, of course, does not use the Respondus Lockdown Browser because you are able to use that additional material on that part of the test. So let's take a look at Block B. What did we learn? Review all of this information so you will know what you need to know for the test. I would encourage you to have already taken one attempt at filling in your study guide. And now you can have that study guide with you as we review block B and you can pick up any information that you didn't get along the way. So we started off block B talking about variances. And I introduced variance by referring back to variability, something that we discussed, well, way back in the beginning. So variability, how close or far apart scores are around the mean. When there's a large difference among the scores, those data are said to contain a lot of variability. But when the scores are very close together around the mean, we would say that there is a small amount of variability within that data set. Well, that tells us that the mean is going to be a better predictor when variability is low. If all of the scores are very close to the mean, well, then the mean is going to be a great predictor because there's very little error between the highest and the lowest score. They're all very close to the mean. So the mean is going to be a great predictor. If the scores are varied and spread out and widely distributed, well, then the mean is not that useful. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us as much as when variability is low. Now, similarly, a 95% confidence interval, which gives us a range of confidence of where the mean would fall as we're estimating from our sample to our, to our population. That 95% confidence interval is going to be a better predictor when your sample size is large. If you are basing your estimates on a large number of people, then you're going to have a better estimator than if you only have a few people in your data set. As your sample size increases, you have more people, then your confidence interval narrows. Just like having small amounts of variability around a mean, a narrow confidence interval is a much better predictor. It's more precise. When we are comparing two variances to each other, we use an F test. This is the same test that we will use with an ANOVA. Now, that F test for two sample variances, where we can compare any two sample variances, is something that we have encountered earlier when we were looking at independent samples t-tests. And there we called it a Levine's test. One assumption of the independent samples t-test is homogeneity of variance. Levine's test tells us whether those variances are similar, homogeneous. But we can also use the same math to do this F test for two sample variances. That test does not make any assumptions about which group is first or second in the numerator or the denominator of the F test. However, you should pay attention to the sample variances when you set up your F test. And you should choose the data set with the larger sample variance to be in the numerator. That goes on the top of the F ratio. The sample with the smaller variance will go on the bottom or the denominator. We will do an inference test with variances where we compare a sample variance to a known population variance. And for that, we will use a chi-squared distribution. 
However, we also learned about the chi-square goodness of fit tests that we can use for making inferences about data. Let's start with the assumptions of that chi-square test. First of all, the data can be nominal or ordinal, counts, something that we couldn't do with scale level data. Now, there are no assumptions about the normality of the data or the distribution of the data. Chi-square is a distribution-free test. However, in the cell counts, the expected values should not have any frequencies below 5. The minimum in each cell should be 5, and there should not be any zero counts, especially for the observed frequencies. The settings for the Nolan Alternative Hypothesis are different than for a t-test in that we don't use math to describe the null hypothesis. We simply say all options are chosen randomly, giving us an alternative that the options are not chosen randomly. And you would customize those null and alternative hypotheses. If we were choosing among types of serial, you would say each serial is chosen randomly. Or among cars, each type of car is chosen randomly. The alpha level we will keep at 0 0.05, although we can set that to other levels if you choose. The degrees of freedom for the chi-square goodness of fit test is k minus 1, where k is the number of categories. If we're choosing among four serials, then you have three degrees of freedom. Five types of cars would be four degrees of freedom. So let me specify something about this degrees of freedom just so you don't get confused because we use this both for variances and for frequencies. When you are performing statistical inferences about frequencies, counts, the goodness of fit test, then we use the degrees of freedom for k minus 1 in our chi-square. However, when we did our statistical inferences about a population variance be compared to a sample variance, for that we use a chi-square of n minus 1. Now, this is a very specific example of using n minus 1 in chi-square. Typically, almost always, chi-squares you will see being used with a k minus 1 degrees of freedom. The exception is when we are comparing a sample variance or estimating from a sample variance to a population. The next area that we went into was ANOVA. And let's review some of the settings for ANOVA and understand why we need ANOVA. The problem that is solved by ANOVA has to do with these t-tests that we learned about last block. And the t-tests are wonderful. However, each t-test has a 0.05 level of error. Five times out of 100, you will get an extreme score that uh, looks like it is statistically significant, but it's not truly different. So a 5% error rate. Well, that's all right with one t-test. But if you have multiple t-tests, each with a 0.05 error rate, we have the problem of probability pyramiding. The error rate starts to increase dramatically. And eventually we get to a place where if we do enough t-tests on the same data, at least one will be wrong. It will be a type 1 error, but we will not know which one it is. We need to solve for that problem. So what we do is instead of analyzing the mean differences, we analyze the variance, which we call the analysis of variance or ANOVA. The requirements for a one-way ANOVA are that it be done with three or more groups. However, you can do an ANOVA with only two groups, the same as you would with a t-test. And if you do an f-test with only two groups, you can take the square root of the f value. That will be a t-value. The two tests are mathematically related. The null hypothesis for an ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA, is mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 equals mu4 equals mu5 if we had multiple groups. Each of the groups is drawn from a population with the same mean. The alternative hypothesis would be mu1 does not equal mu2, does not equal mu3. As with other hypothesis testing that we have done, we will assume an alpha level of 0 0.05, for a two-tailed test when we do our ANOVA settings. 
The ANOVA is different than the approach we've taken with t-tests in that with a t-test we simply compared the two groups so we could tell which one was larger, which one was smaller. With an ANOVA we can simply tell that the groups are different and so if we know that they are different we need to follow up on that information. ANOVA is an omnibus test. It tests for overall differences between groups. It tells us that some groups were significantly different. It does not tell us which groups were significantly different from each other. So if we know that we have three groups and at least one of them is different from at least one other group, we have to follow up that statistically significant ANOVA with a post hoc test. Post hoc meaning after. We do the post hoc after the significant ANOVA. If the ANOVA is not significant, that means there are no differences to find. We don't need to do a post hoc, there's no differences. So the only time we would do a post hoc is if the ANOVA was statistically significant. Let's review some definitions for the analysis of variance. The independent variable we will call a factor. Now if that factor is type of car and there are three types of cars, then there are three levels within that factor. The level can also be called a treatment. If we are comparing four different diets, the factor is type of diet. The levels are diet 1, 2, 3, and 4, or the treatments are 1, 2, 3, and 4. The symbol for the number of levels in a factor is K. And of course, as with every other test we've learned about, the number of subjects, the sample size, is N. The differences produced by that independent variable, the type of diet or type of car, those are called treatment effects. The individuals in each treatment group will be different from each other, perhaps by randomness, perhaps also because of a treatment effect. So what we will do, this is the logic of analysis of variance, is we'll consider the variability within each group, within each type of diet, and we will consider the variability between the groups. Does one diet have a larger effect than the other? So we are partitioning our total variance into two sources, between treatment variance and within treatment variance. The variance between the groups, so this diet compared to that one, that's the treatment effect. There is also some error or chance or randomness that explains differences between groups, but mostly it's that treatment effect. Now the variance within the groups is due only to randomness, chance, error. Some people gaining or losing a little bit more than others. So the variance within is error, the variance between is treatment effect plus error by dividing the between variance by the within variance we're canceling out the effects of the error leaving us with the treatment effect. If there is no treatment effect, if there is no statistical significance between the groups, it's basically randomness divided by randomness. Anything divided by itself is one. So if the F ratio is non-significant, those values will tend to stack up around one. And that F ratio will always be positive. Let me say something about the mean square. Now the mean square for a group is the sum of squares for that group divided by N, the sample size for that group. Therefore, another way of thinking about that F ratio, the between over within, is the mean square for the treatment divided by the mean square for the error term. As with the t-test, ANOVA has an assumption for homogeneity of variance. The variances within each group should be approximately equal. This is the homogeneity of variance assumption and as with a t-test it is tested by Levine's test for equality of variances telling us whether those sample variances are approximately equal. If you do an ANOVA and you look at the assumptions tested by Levine's test and find that Levine's test is significant, 
the assumption has been violated. The best solution is to use Welch's ANOVA to address that violation of homogeneity of variance. However, ANOVA is robust to violations of homogeneity of variance when the sample sizes are equal. If there is a violation, however, each of the groups has the same sample size and the group sizes are over 30, you are usually safe to use ANOVA instead of the Welch's test. The degrees of freedom for a one-way ANOVA will consider both the numerator and the denominator for the F ratio. In the numerator, we would calculate the degrees of freedom between as K minus 1. If we were comparing four groups, then K minus 1 would be 3. We would calculate the degrees of freedom within, for the denominator, as N minus K, where N is the total sample size and K is the number of groups. So let's say we had a ridiculously small number of participants. There were only 20. There are four groups. So 20 minus 4 would be 16. The degrees of freedom total is N minus 1. If there are 20 participants in our study, N minus 1 would be 19. The degrees of freedom between plus the degrees of freedom within will always add up to the degrees of freedom total. Let's review the information that we find in the ANOVA summary table. It tells us seven things. In column one, we find the source of the variability. Variability within, variability between, and total variability. In column two, degrees of freedom. K minus one, N minus K, and K minus one. In column three, the sum of squares associated with each group. The mean square is the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. For instance, 24.552 divided by 3 is 8.184. This is the measure of variance, or the mean square. Dividing the mean square between by the mean square within, we get the F ratio of 17.619. There is 17.619 times more variability between than within. Column 6 is the p-value, the probability, the likelihood of getting these results if the null hypothesis was true. And in column 7, I've added the effect size, which is partial eta squared. Partial eta squared is the strength of the association for an ANOVA, and it's interpreted in the same way as an r-squared value would be for correlation. The closer that value is to 1, the greater the strength of the association for the treatment. That should help you determine what you need to know for the first part of the test. The second part of the test will be the applied section where you apply what you have learned in class to actually do these analyses. You will receive an Excel data set titled Unit Test 2 Data. It has three tabs, Manufacturer, Auto Loyalty, and MSHP. You should also get the Variance Week 5 calculator that I created for you, the Chi-Squared calculator from Week 6, and the ANOVA Multi-Tool from Week 7 and 8. You will also find on Blackboard a structured answer sheet called the Test 2 Answer Sheet in the form of a PDF. This is where you will put all of the answers from the analyses that you will do on your data set. Once you have completed all of the analyses and filled in the answer sheet, then you would begin the applied portion of the test. You would use that answer sheet to fill in the blanks. So there will be no analysis while you are working on the test. Of course, we won't have lockdown browser for that portion of the test. We will for the earlier portion of the test. And finally, that 
study guide that we used on the previous portion of the test that will be used for the multiple choice true false portion that cannot be used on your test because that portion of the test will use the Respondus Lockdown browser. And just for reference, here is an example of what that test to answer sheet will look like. This is what you'll want to have completely filled out before you begin the applied portion of the test. Well, I wish you the best of luck on this test. Study hard, give yourself plenty of time, get an early start. And remember, the test is due at the end of week eight. However, you do have until the end of week nine, Sunday night at midnight, to complete all of the assignments and the tests for block B. Get an early start, and I hope that you do very well.